right, wait, we have to do part four now. Are you ready? You're not ready? All right, well, we're gonna do it anyway. Hi, everyone. Um, I am back for part four of the story of the true events surrounding the shark attacks of 1916. So when we left off, I know that Captain Cottrell was running around Matawan trying to warn people that there was a shark in the creek, but nobody believed him. Meanwhile, um, Joseph Dunn and his friends are swimming in the creek. So let's pick up and see what is happening. All right, do you wanna go? You go. Nobody was going to believe his story, but the captain had spent years fishing the world's oceans. He had come face to face with some of the fiercest beasts in the sea. He was certain that there was a shark in Matawan Creek in the same waters where local kids loved to swim. The captain rushed back to the dock and fired up his motorboat, steering it up the winding creek and shouting out warnings. Joseph, Michael, and Jerry were not yet in the water when the captain was spreading the alarm. And Cottrell just missed another group of swimmers, 12-year-old Lester Stilwell and his pals, who had come to the creek to cool off. Cottrell's boat was out of sight by the time Lester and his friends arrived at the dock, peeled off their sweaty clothes, and jumped into the water. What happened next would haunt Lester's friends for the rest of their lives. Lester was floating on his back when seemingly out of nowhere, the shark exploded out of the water, its enormous jaws wide open. His friends stared in shock as the beast snatched Lester by the arm and pulled him underwater. The boy surfaced just one more time screaming, but there was nothing for his terrified friends to do but run and get help. They sprinted into town half naked, soaking wet and sobbing. A shark's got Lester, they cried. A shark's got Lester. That's very scary when I picture that. The townspeople who saw the hysterical boys knew something horrific had happened to the young Lester Stilwell. Soon dozens of people were at the dock where the boys had been swimming, shouting out for Lester. It couldn't really be a shark, could it? Was some other monstrous animal in the creek? Had the boys simply drowned? In the swirl of fear and confusion, one terrible fact could not be denied. Lester Stilwell was gone. Two young men at the dock, Stanley Fisher and George Burlow, were determined to at least find Lester's body. Stanley and George took a rowboat to the middle of the creek and used poles to probe the deep water. When that didn't work, they got into the creek and began to dive to the bottom. Over and over, the men held their breath and dove down, groping blindly in the water for Lester's body. Up and down they went, up and down, as the crowd stood in stunned silence. An hour passed, then two. Just when the search seemed hopeless, Fisher burst up through the water, gasping for breath, shouting that he had found Lester's body. But suddenly there was a thundering splash. Fisher's arms flew up into the air. He's got me, he cried. The shark had clamped its jaws onto Fisher's thigh and was trying to drag him underwater. The crowd stood in helpless horror as Fisher tried to fight off the shark. He pummeled the beast with his fists and tried to gouge it in the eye. He twisted and thrashed. Each time the shark dragged Fisher under the water, Fisher managed to battle his way back up. And then miraculously, Fisher broke free from the shark's jaws. Gasping for breath, he managed to swim back to the dock, his face twisted in agony and exhaustion. Men flocked to him and strong arms hauled Fisher out of the water. When people in the crowd saw Fisher's leg, they erupted in gasps of horror. Much of Fisher's thigh was gone, the flesh and muscle torn away. Blood spouted from a gaping wound. The doctor and the crowd bandaged the leg and Fisher was whisked to the hospital. He would be dead before sunset. Lester Stilwell's body remained at the bottom of the creek. Meanwhile, only one and a half miles down the creek, Joe, Michael, and Jerry had just started their swim. They had no idea what was happening at the creek. It wasn't until the shouts of warning shattered their joyful afternoon that they had any idea that they were in danger, and by then, of course, it was too late. The shark grabbed hold of Joseph Dunn, ready to take its third victim of the day. But as the shark pulled Joe under, Michael and Jerry dove into the creek. They grabbed hold of Joe's arms and tried to wrestle him out of the shark's jaws. It seemed hopeless. The shark was too strong. But then a sputtering motorboat appeared. It was Captain Cottrell and two other men. Those men jumped into the water and were soon part of the terrible match of tug of war with the shark. Joseph, numb with shock, was sure he'd be ripped in two. But suddenly the shark opened its jaws. Joe was free. 
Michael and the men pulled Joe up to the dock and then gently placed him into Captain Cottrell's boat. Joe was alive, although his leg was horribly mangled and bleeding heavily. Michael joined him in the boat and gripped his brother's hand as Captain Cottrell gunned the boat back down the creek toward Matawan. The dock there was still crowded with people. Joe was carried into a motor car and rushed toward the hospital. The 10 mile journey to the hospital would take one and a half hours along a winding, mumpy road. Nobody believed Joseph Dunn would survive. The deaths of Charles Bruder and Charles Van Zandt were horrifying, but the Matawan attacks in a creek 15 miles from shore, that sent waves of shock around the world. By the next day, America went to war against sharks. Fishermen charged out to sea, ready to kill any shark on sight. In Matawan, Lester Stilwell's body was finally recovered from the creek. People vowed revenge on the monster that had killed him and Stanley Fisher, both beloved members of their community. Furious men in boats prowled the creek, harpoons raised, women armed with rifles stood in the tall grass on the creek banks, firing at anything that moved. American President Woodrow Wilson ordered a Coast Guard ship into the waters off New Jersey with orders to destroy any shark that was spotted. The shark killing frenzy would have continued, but on July 14, a man named Michael Schleiser killed a great white shark in Raritan Bay near Matawan Creek. He hauled the shark to shore and sliced open its stomach. Inside were 15 pounds of flesh and bones that seemed to belong to a human. The world rejoiced. The Jersey man-eater had been killed. There were no more shark attacks that summer, which made it clear to most people that Schleiser had indeed caught the shark that had attacked all five swimmers. Sharks quickly faded out of the headlines as Americans geared up for a far bigger war, World War I. By the following spring, the first American troops were in Europe fighting the Germans and their allies. Today, the shark attacks of 1916 have not been forgotten. In fact, many questions remain about what really happened during those 12 days of terror. Was Schleiser's shark really the killer? Was it a great white or a bull shark? Was it one shark or several that committed the attacks? If it was one shark, what caused it to stalk humans with such unnatural ferocity? Scientists continue to study this unusual and horrific event. One thing is certain though, for the Dunn family, that summer of 1916 ended on a joyful note because Joseph Dunn survived his injuries. On September 15th, two months after the attack, he was released from the hospital. He was badly scarred and limping, but as the months wore on, he fully recovered. He lived to an old age, but he never really talked much about his experiences in the summer of 1916. But those who knew Joseph Dunn said he always considered himself a lucky man. After all, he alone had escaped from the jaws of the New Jersey man-eater. So I hope you liked that story. You know, all of my I Survive books are, of course, true events. And as I told you in the beginning of this series, I, I love when I find true stories of real kids. Um, that went through real events and learn from them and, and when I can use their true stories to inspire, um, inspire me as I'm writing my I Survive stories. All the I Survive books are historical fiction so I make up the characters, but if you've read The Shark Attacks of 1916, my I Survive book, you'll know that there are some similarities. I mean, the places are the same. Uh, my character, Chet Roscoe, isn't really like Joseph Dunn. He has a whole fictional story. His family has been moving all around America in 1916. He's very unsettled. His parents are now living um, uh, you know, out west trying because his father's trying to find a job and trying to start a new business. So Chet has never had the opportunity to meet new friends and really settle in a place until he gets to this beautiful town near Matawan Creek where he is living with his Uncle Jerry and working in Uncle Jerry's diner and finally he he's feeling happy and finally he's making some friends, this great group of boys that he's just really loves and goes swimming with. Um, and it's, you know, then of course these terrible things happen. In many ways, my character of Chet is based on Joseph Dunn and what happened to him. Um, and 
as I've learned more and more about the shark attacks, also, as I said to you before, I realized that it had unintended consequences. And this war on sharks that continued for many, many years um, had a terrible impact on the shark populations in oceans. So I've come through all of my research on sharks, um, really appreciating these amazing, these amazing creatures, even um, while I understand that there are things we can all do to reduce our risk of ever having an encounter like Joseph Dunn. So if you live near an ocean, you should never swim alone. You should never swim if there are seals and other sea mammals in the water, because that's going to attract sharks. You should never swim at a, at a beach that doesn't have a lifeguard. You shouldn't wear jewelry when you go into the water because the sparkles can attract sharks. You should never um, swim with a dog because the dog's dog paddling too mimics it imitates those waves that an injured sea mammal might make, and a shark can detect those waves in the water from miles away. So we can learn about sharks, we can appreciate them, we can be fascinated by them and learn more about them and work to protect them. And we can also make sure that we protect ourselves because when we go swimming in the ocean, we're not swimming in our own home, we're swimming in the home that belongs to the creatures um, who thrive there. So on that note, I hope that you enjoyed my read aloud and that you're going to want to learn more on your own. And I can't wait to see you next time. Bye-bye.